morning. Uh, so my uh, um, course title is exactly solved models. Um, so I thought uh, um, there should be some, just to keep uh, my uh, target, make some targets, I thought you should have some learning outcomes from the course. So at the end of the five lectures, I thought uh, one thing that you should be able to do is to solve exactly, to give, to give a generic model how we can solve on a simple lattice called the Bezier lattice. Then uh, if I give you a, a, a model on a 1D lattice, a short range model, you should be able to set up a transfer matrix and be able to solve them. And uh, then, uh, uh, of course, not all models are solvable. So given a generic model, how do you, how do you try a uh, expansion from the low temperature limit and the high temperature limit? And then I will try to also solve the 2D icing model using uh, the fermion method. So the essential steps in that, at least, one should be able to follow. Especially, you should be able to reproduce the jordan Buchner transformation. And finally, you know, in the last lecture, I'll try to cover uh, some uh, the phenomenology of other solved models. Especially, I'll introduce the notion of Bethe and that in the constant six vertex model, which you should be able to do. So in the end of the course, we'll try to uh, look at this and see how much we have achieved. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll write a bit bigger so that I started writing smaller and then I'll write a bit bigger from that. So, um, so the first question is why exactly solve models? Why do you want to solve a model exactly? So there's the obvious reason that if you solve it exactly, you know the answer answer correctly. It's not like doing numerics or uh, you do some approximation where you're always worried about whether it's right or wrong. Secondly, in the context of critical phenomena, uh, there is some another advantage. Suppose I solve uh, a simple model, like the icing model, and I get some answer exactly. I get, let's say, mu equal to one. Now, uh, in, uh, Mustansir was talking about the feature of, of this uh, concept of universality is a critical point. So it doesn't matter what model you start with. If you're able to get the get an answer from a simple model, that model answer turns out to be the exact answer. In the sense there's an approximation involved in the answer. So if I say nu equal to one, it's not that if I make the model different, I'll get, it, I'll get a different mu. So this is one area where you can solve ex simple models, but get the answer you get an experiment correctly. The exact answer you get an experiment. Uh, and, so, and then uh, another motivation is that, you know, uh, there are many uh, uh, numerical techniques that one tries out and approximation methods. And exactly solved models act as a benchmark for testing these uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. So that is the motivation for looking at exactly solved models. So for some time, uh, I'll be spending time on the icing model. So let's define... Uh, Also, uh, some amount of algebra is not avoidable. Uh, so, uh, if you get lost, five, five days is a bit, um, it's very boring. So, if I go too fast or some step is not understood, please stop and ask. It's important to go, at least in the beginning, go slow. Uh, in the end, we'll go a bit fast. So, I think model is, uh, um, is the paradigm for uh, critical phenomena. Uh, the Hamiltonian, so defined on the lattice, at each lattice side, there's a spin variable SI. So there's a spin variable SI at each side I, it takes value plus one or minus one. And uh, this notation stands for nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor spins are coupled to a coupling constant J, which we'll take to be positive. So that if two things align, then the energy goes down. And then there's a magnetic field H that couples to the spin at each side, SI. Okay. Now, uh, um, uh, this particular model in, you know, in the Abhishek's lectures, what he showed 
uh, using this spirals argument was that this was a transition from a low temperature phase where most of the spins are either up or down to a phase where there is no uh, uh, preferred orientation for the spins. So there's a uh, ferromagnetic paramagnetic transition. Increasing temperature. So, uh, so what we like to do first is to solve this model on a simple lattice and see these features exactly. So, uh, uh, so first, what we do is Simplest mean field theory, let me do a quick re recap. This is the Curie Weiss mean field theory. Uh, this you covered. So I'll just illustrate the steps. So this is the Hamiltonian. So the first approximation is to say I make an approximate mean field. Hamiltonian, which is and the summation over Sj you replace by the mean field, which is Q times M. So Q is the condition number, M is the mean magnetization at that site, and you know my reach. This is the Curie Weiss mean field approximation. And the uh, simplification is that once you do this, it becomes independent spins. Of course, it can connect it to M. And the equation you get from solving this is M is and uh, for low, uh, for, so this curve. For low, low, for small beta, the curve looks like that one. So beta small, and for large beta, the curve has a smaller slope. The other way around. Beta large. So as you change beta, the slope of this curve changes the origin, and you have three roots or one root, and that was the solution of the mean field icing model. And sometimes uh, when there are three roots, you get a non-zero M, and otherwise you have one M. I'm assuming that you have, I'm sure you did this, no? Okay, so the, this is the uh, transition that one finds. At a transition point where this slope, where this slope is beta G So there are some, so this kind of mean fields give an answer which has a transition from ferromagnetic to a paramagnetic. But the kind of approximation that goes in, so you replace a particular term here by, by an average magnetization. These are very uncontrolled approximations. So uh, uh, first of all, you do, you do not even know whether the answers you get. Ah, sorry. So the, the approximations are uncontrolled, and as well as there's no nice way of improving them from the, the kind of systematically improving them. In addition, there is a major problem with this. Suppose I look at the free energy. The free energy has some thermodynamic properties. For example, it should be convex function of temperature, and so on. If you make an approximation like this, you're not even sure whether you're violating some basic uh, theorem of thermodynamics. So one way to overcome this is to solve the Hamiltonian on a simplified lattice. It may not be that square lattice, but it's all on a model which is simplified, whereby you guarantee that all the thermodynamics is correct. There are no approximations involved in the solution, but in the lattice, 
so that uh, the thermodynamics will have no contradiction with each other. So one suitable lattice for this is the Bethe lattice. So I'll define the Bethe lattice and I'll tell you how to solve the Ising model on that. You know, any generic model you can solve in the Bethe lattice. There are some, there are some uh, certain simplifications will become clear as I do the solution. Okay, so what is the Bethe lattice? Is the motivation clear? Why we like to solve? So, uh, so the Bethe lattice construction is as follows. You take a central site and you connect few sites to that. So this, this I'll call my site zero, central site. There are uh, two sites in the first shell. So in this case there are three, q equal to three. I then connect q minus one to them. So that is two more. That's a second shell. And then you go out like, sorry. And then you go out as many as you want. Okay, so let me just write down uh, the number of sides in correct first shell had q minus 1 the q the second shell had q into q minus 1 then there are q into q minus 1 then i add q minus 1 to each one so then i get this formula there now, at every instant, you have to make sure that they never make a loop. So this tree has no loops. So no loops. And that is this. Uh, which makes it simple to solve. So, so, so this particular, you can go up to n shells, let us say. So you have a tree, tree because there are no loops. And that tree is sometimes called the Cayley tree. So let us look at some features of this tree before putting it. Now on this tree, we are going to put a spin system. It could be the icing model or could be any other system, not the spin system also. But before that, let us look at some properties of the Cayley tree. Okay. So, uh, so we want to ask, uh, what what is the dimension it lives in the Cayley tree? So is the construction clear? So to each side you you keep on adding q minus one, uh, so the so that the you keep on adding q minus one sides outwards. The average the, so that the co coordination number is q. Now let us look at uh, how many sides are there in. Uh, a Cayley tree of n shells. So this is one. So I sum up all the particles in each shell, and this is my number of particles in a Cayley tree of n shells. Uh, so this is one. Geometric, uh, no. So this is my answer. Uh, while the number of particles in my nth shell is q into q minus one. So now, if I take the ratio S n, so I ask in my in my Cayley tree, how many particles live on the surface as opposed to the bulk? So I take my ratio Sn by Vn. In the limit, n is large. So this 
this term dominates and you, what you get is uh, a finite fraction. So most of my sites live on the surface of the Bethel ladder, of the, of the scaly tree. Suppose I had a sphere and I ask how many particles live on the surface. So if I have a three-dimensional sphere, the 3D My S number of particles on the bulk goes as R square. In general, R to power D. R to power D. And uh, D minus 1 and D. So that if I take the ratio, the ratio goes to 0. Most of the particles even the bulk. But the Cayley tree has a problem that most of the particles even the surface. Okay, this also means that the effective dimension is like D infinity. Why? Because if I take Sn by Vn for such a system, it goes as 1 by R, it goes as roughly uh, 1 by D. So if it goes to a constant, it's like D equal to infinity. So the Cayley tree is roughly, if I, if, if is like solving the model in D equal to infinity, but there is still this problem that the surface is too strong. So when you do static models, you always want the surface effects to be minimal, the bulk effects to be maximum. So we like to ask how, by take the Cayley tree and how do you take the limit where the surface is not important and that limit is called the Bethel lattice. So uh, we will we'll, uh, do an example and see how that is done. So Cayley tree, so what you want to do is Site B B site So we like to take the limit, solve the model in the Cayley tree, but ask how does the site deep inside the bulk behave independent of the surface? So that that is that particular solution we will call as Bethel lattice. Okay, is this okay? So the first thing to do is to take this tree or this Bethel lattice and put spins on each side. So on each side I have a spin variable Si taking plus or minus 1 exactly as the icing model. It's only the lattice that has changed. The model remains the same. And we like to ask how to solve this model. So the, so the first step, so solution, this one. Ah, so we like to, so the Cayley tree, if I just solve the model on the Cayley tree, on a finite size Cayley tree, the most of the, the statistics is affected by the surface in the bulk, in the, in the surface. So the idea is how can you ask, if you take, an infinite, you take the infinite limit of the Cayley tree and ask how does the site in the bulk behave, independent of the surface. So that particular solution will be called the Bethe solution. So that will become clear when I solve the icing model, how you take that limit. Let's just go ahead, we'll just. So let me do a solution uh, on Bethel problem. So the first step is to take the Bethel lattice. So I, I, I'll use the word Bethel lattice and Keri tree interchangeably. Take the central site and make a cut three cuts or two cuts like that. Okay. So if you cut these three uh, bonds, what are you left with? You're left with a subtree here, a, a tree here, and a tree here, which is a bit different from the original tree. Because so if I look at this particular branch, I have a tree which goes down two. Now this root side is slightly different from the other sides. These have coordination number three, while this has coordination number two. Okay. So this is this particular. Uh, so 
this particular tree I will call a rooted uh, subtree. So, it is a tree with one root site being a bit different from the other sites. So, suppose I give you the partition function that given this particular rooted subtree of length n or, or uh, n, share, n generations, I ask, I give you the partition function. I tell you the partition function of this subtree is g to be plus 1 or g of minus 1, depending on whether the root side is plus 1 or the root side is minus 1. So, I will call these as partial partition function. Is that clear? So, I take a rooted subtree. The, the root side can take value of plus 1 or minus 1 depending on the spin at that side. And if it is plus 1, conditioned on the root side being plus 1, I will call the partition function g of plus 1. And otherwise, I will call it g of minus 1 if it is minus 1. So, these I will call as partial partition function. Now, the point is that once I know these partial partition functions, I can construct the partition function of the full tree. So, what is that? So now my z is, uh, is my central site. So now my central site can be plus 1 or minus 1. I take three rooted subtrees and join them together to the central site as follows. So, uh, what will, so if I know this g, uh, g plus and g minus, what is the answer for z? Can you, you can take a one, one minute and write down the expression and then I will just ask. So, I have these three rooted subtrees and I am joining, joining, them, joining them together to central site, which could be plus or a minus. So, I want to write an expression for z. So, why don't you try for one minute, see if you can do, and then I, I, we can just discuss and then try. Does anybody have uh, uh, given g plus and g minus? Uh, any suggestions how to write z? Yeah, so all you have to do, uh, as we pointed out, is to sum over all possible configurations of the root site variable. This could be plus. So, uh, if I look at this root side, it could be plus or minus, it could be plus or minus here, plus or minus here, but they are all independent. What happens in this, that is a key simplification in the beta lattice. What happens in this subtree does not affect what happens in that subtree because there are no loops. Okay. So, suppose this was plus, then you have a weight e to the power beta j coming from the icing interaction, it, it, it favors uh, from this Hamiltonian. Uh, but that should come with a g plus. If it was minus, I will get e to the minus beta j, g minus. That is for this subtree. But then I could ha I have the same thing for these two also. It is cube of that, three of them. Plus for these ones, I get, if I have a plus here, I get e to minus beta j. Is 
that uh, expression OK? So it just says I sum over all possible configurations of the rooted of the root site of these rooted subtrees and with the appropriate weight associated with them. Is this particular uh, way of writing OK? Yeah, for this particular, we have, no, we have taken the icing model. But if it were not the nearest neighbor interactions, you can figure out how to write that. It is not necessary that it should be nearest neighbor alone. But here, of course, this is for the normal icing model, nearest neighbor icing model interaction. Okay. So also, we'd like to know what is my... Oh, it's all, sorry, the lattice sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, sorry, I meant lattice sites. Uh, so this is my partition function. So I'd also like to know what's my magnetization at the central site. So if I take my M, this is exactly an expression like this. If I put plus here, I get value plus one. So you, you see, let me just write. will come with a minus sign because this expectation will do so that gives you the value of uh, the minus sign because you know there is a minus one here so if I know the partial partition functions I can write down the partition function as well as the magnetization of the entire system Okay, so now the next step is how to write down, so that is step two, how to, how to compute the partial partition functions. But that, once you write something like this, that's quite straightforward. So, uh, I want to construct the partial partition function of a rooted subtree of n shells, or n plus one shells, let us say. So, I consider, uh, in this case, we'll work with Q equal to three. So I consider two uh, subtrees of uh, N shells. So it's just a partial partition, partition function of a tree like this with a root site here and uh, each one connected to Q sites below. This is a bit different from this particular original lattice, in which every lattice site had Q neighbors. So just the, is, it, is the partition function of this one. D plus, D plus represents the partition function where this root site is plus. And D minus, or sometimes plus one and sometimes minus one. D minus one or minus is the one where it is, the spin is minus one. Mm -hmm. Here. So this one says I take the central site and I connect three subtrees to that. So this subtree could be plus or minus. If it was plus, then I have two plus spins coming. There's a plus spin here and a plus spin here. That is a Boltzmann factor it was beta j. But then I have to say that it is actually g plus here. And then I could have a minus one there, which is little minus beta j, the minus sign. But then these three subtrees are independent of each other. So I get a cube term there, cubic term. And similarly here, I have my, is ex exactly this, this uh, okay. So now I take, I, I want to write a recursion relation for my uh, G's now, G plus and G minus. So to construct a partial partition function for a subtree of N plus one shells, you consider two subtrees of N shells so I denote it like this. You add a root site, one extra site you add, and then connect these two. So these are uh, n, n shells. So 
now I want to ask what's the partition function of this combined system. So I denote it by G prime to show that it is one, it is the n plus one shell. Now what is G prime of plus? And let me call the partition function of these ones as G. In terms of G, what is G prime? If you have written down something, if you understood this, you should be able to write down an expression for that too. So it is e to the power beta j, g plus, plus e to the minus beta j, g minus the whole square. And It's, uh, it's a power two because there are two subtrees now coming. And the e to the power beta j factor because you have plus plus appearing, minus beta j because a plus and a minus, and so on. Okay. The argument is exactly the is exactly the same as what you have, what, what you had for writing down. So now, uh, so the so uh, in principle, if you have n shells, and if you look at the surface. There is just one side, the partition function is one. If you iterate backwards for a shell of length n, you can compute the partition function exactly. You can compute the g for each shell and finally plug it back in here to get the partition function. So, but we like to do, but we now we like to take the limit of this bulk lattice. So let us see how we can do that. Uh, now, how does uh, if I take some uh, G prime, there are n shells of n so if I have uh, a system of with n particles, let us say, n n sides, how does my partition function increase with n? E to the power n. So in general, this will go as If I take the partition function and ask how does it increase with the number of sides, it increases exponentially with n. But it could have a brief, but will this lambda be the same or different? I have written here g plus and g minus. I can put a lambda plus and a lambda minus here. Will they be the same or different? Even, okay, uh, so one, one statement is that in the in zero field, we have all, 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 already done a zero, zero field, but he is saying that for zero field, A plus and A, lambda plus and lambda minus should be the same. Different, could be different. Could be the piece, uh, what would anybody, any other suggestion is there? Huh? Yeah, independent of what the Hamiltonian should be the same, because all we are doing in this is changing the boundary a little bit. And in uh, statistical mechanics, it doesn't matter. The partition function, the free energy doesn't depend on the boundary you put in, boundary conditions you put in. So irrespective of whether h is zero or not zero, your lambda plus and lambda minus should be the same. It doesn't depend on the bulk. It depend, doesn't depend on the boundary. But a plus and a minus need not be the same. There's no reason why they should be the same in general. Okay. So when I look at g prime and compare with g, g, g G prime has one more particle added to that, or not one more particle, there's two, many more particles added to that. Therefore, G prime is much, much larger than G. But if I take the ratio of G plus by G minus, that for large n is, in, is uh, n goes to infinity, is independent of n. Yeah, there are two, uh, G stand for these uh, trees of N shells. Here? No, 
I am adding, I am going to construct a tree with n plus 1 shells. So for that I construct, I first take two trees of sh n shells each. They already have a partition function of g plus. Then I join them together. This square is the, this two is for the fact that there are two of them being joined. If I had q of them, q of them being joined, it will become q. That's only different. But g plus individually will diverge with, uh, exponentially with n. So the, uh, the point here is that if you have something like this, if I take the ratio, the ratios go to a constant as for large n. A is some prefactor, some prefactor. In addition to the exponential factor, the exponential comes with the prefactor there, just that. In a generic uh, system, unless there are no long range interactions, you can ignore the boundary. No, you have a Hamiltonian with a field, whatever that may be. But once I have the, once you define the Hamiltonian and you define the free energy in the bulk, that bulk free energy is not going to get affected by the boundary. Unless, so for example, uh, uh, the places where, uh, unless there is some they do get affected in the sense, for example, if I have icing model at low temperature and uh, there's an ordered phase, if I change my bulk, the boundary from H plus to H minus, it changes in that thing. So that's look, other, other than that, <laughs> it, if I, if, even if I do that, my bulk free energy, it still goes to the same lambda. It just goes S to minus S but the free energy remains the same. Okay. Uh, so this ratio is, doesn't diverge with n, that's the point. So the key is to take this part, uh, partition functions and take the ratio of them. Okay. So that's a step three. Ah, okay. So, uh, so, so we have this partition functions. Now we are going to take the ratio of g plus to g minus and ask do we get some uh, sensible answer from there. Okay. So, uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll denote x is g plus by g minus. So if I take that equation there and I take the ratio, I get x prime. Something like that. Uh, x plus x is this ratio of g plus to g minus, x prime is the ratio in the next shell as compared to x. And these x's are going to be independent of how many shells you have. Is that point clear? So now I start with one shell, I keep on iterating this backwards, x prime, I keep on going further and further inside and I ask at which point will I lose memory of my uh, surface? It is when I don't care what my initial conditions were. I look at the fixed points of this equation. So this is x prime equals f of x. Fixed points is x star. So if I look at the fixed points, it says I don't care what I started my initial value of x with. So the initial value of x is decided by boundary. I forget about them and I look at my fixed points. So that ensures that I have no memory of my surface. And this solution, this gives you the Bethe uh, lattice solution. Or oh, this is called the Bethe lattice. The name Bethe lattice is because of some historic reasons. Uh, because uh, after this Curie Weiss mean field theory, uh, there was a uh, proposal by Bethe where he included more nearest neighbor interactions exactly and found some answer. 
which improved this to something else. I think q minus q or something. And when you solve exactly on the beta on this KD tree, you get the same answer beta had proposed earlier. Therefore, the name beta that is sort of okay. huh? uh, x prime is the ratio at the n plus one shell. So if I take this ratio here, g g plus by g minus, it could be a prime variable and g plus by g minus. So I, the prime one I'm calling x prime and g plus by g minus I'm calling x. So uh, yes, and I'm seeing exponent doesn't diverge. So if you iterate for long enough time, it converts on fixed point. So x is some value between, I don't know, it could be value between 0 and infinity actually, min, uh, 0 to infinity. It will convert. So if I plot this particular thing, it, no, it looks, uh, I forget, like that. And if I plot this x, it will intersect at three points. Sorry, depending on the curvature. This, If I plot this, it looks something like this, exactly like this one, uh, which was plotted here. So the number of fixed points can change. So the, the idea for looking at the fixed points is show that it doesn't depend on the, on the surface anymore. It depends only in, on, you know, it doesn't depend on the surface anymore. Okay. So now let us try to do this. So uh, let, try to find the fixed points for the icing model for q equal to 3. Is this clear? The steps are clear? Remember that we could have done this for any of these steps we could have done for Q coordination number, in which case uh, this would have become Q, this would have become Q, 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 this would have become Q minus 1. That would be the only difference. Suppose I had a different model. Instead of icing model, I had a three spin system with some interaction. Then what would change? I'll get G, 1, 2, 3, but the corresponding e to the power beta, instead of e to the beta j, whatever, Hamiltonian in Putin. And similarly here too, I would have g one two three. Okay, so if I had, uh, uh, so it's easy to generalize to any, not just spin system. If I had a spin system where I had a particle here, but I cannot occupy a particle on the nearest neighbor, then I have g of one and zero and a corresponding inter interaction too. So it's possible. It would be possible to do, uh, even though I worked out for q equal to three pi sing, we should be able to do it for a generic system. Now let us see how knowing x star, how can we uh, go ahead? So now let me explicitly solve this for the icing model. For x, this let me find the solution for this one. So, uh, so I look at x. Take a square root, okay. and now uh, let me call y equals x plus two. Oh, no, I'm looking at the fixed point solution. Yeah, x star. By then I have to put a star everywhere. So this is the fixed point. Ah, I'm sorry. So let's just look at the solution of this one. Uh, so uh, uh, to remove this root x, let me put y equals root x. So this becomes x, x y, y square, and so on. So I get y cube. Then y equal to 1 has to be a solution all the time. Why is that? If I put, uh, okay. if I put g plus equal to g minus, I get m equal to 0. The solution m equal to 0 corresponds to g plus equal to g minus, which corresponds to x equal to 1 and y equal to 1. 
So we should check that if I put y equal to 1, you get 1. These two cancel and this is 1. So y equal to 1 is always and corresponds to the disordered phase. So let us subtract out, remove the y equal to 1 solution. So uh, that is y cube minus 1. And remove this y minus 1 throughout. So you get y square. It's a quadratic equation in M, in Y. So Y is uh, uh, ah. So if I put G plus equal to G minus, my uh, these two terms will cancel and m is 0. Yeah, but it's a generic, once I go into the bulk, it's a generic site. We have, we have written for the central site, but once I make my tree infinite in size, and I remove the bulk surface effects, it's a generic site. If I look at the, look at the magnetization at a neighboring site, it's exactly the same. So, plus minus, Square of this uh, okay, so these are my uh, the other solution so one thing you should check also is that if uh, by symmetry if g plus by g minus has a certain fraction then g minus by g plus so should also have the same should also be valid solution there's nothing distinguishing between plus and minus. Therefore, if y is a solution, 1 by y should also be a solution. We should check that y plus y minus equals 1. So that you can check by just putting y to 1 by y here. These two are interchanged. You know, the answer is exactly the same. So one, so one solution is y equal to 1. Then the other solution is some, something like this with the property that the inverses of each other. So, uh, so let us just try to see how do these solutions look and how does the, uh, so is it clear? So we took this uh, uh, beta lattice, defined recursion relations for them, found out some fixed points and found three solutions for the fixed points. Y is x square, the three solutions. So now I like to ask when are these fixed points, uh, how sometimes they are there and sometimes they are not there. So let's try to analyze them a bit better. So first thing is when uh, t goes to zero, that is beta j goes to infinity. Then uh, if I look at the plus one, this term dominates, these two term dominates, okay. So let me just write down y goes Why is that? I can drop this minus 1, I can drop this minus 3 and plus 1. I get a 2 e to the beta g and I get this. And y plus and y minus should go to So, if I were to plot y plus sorry, all the roots, uh, y star function of temperature. For t going to 0, there is one root somewhere here, one root somewhere here, and one is always y equal to 1. At some point, so as you increase temperature, the, the roots become, the fixed points become smaller, and at some point, they join at some value. So let me call this value Tc for the time being. And beyond, at very, high, at very high temperature, 
if I put beta equal to zero, this becomes negative. So these roots don't exist anymore. So this, uh, so beyond this point, uh, presumably there's only one fixed point. But that you can check. You can ask when does the, when do they all meet? They all meet when this becomes zero. And that becomes zero when p to the power two beta dc equals three. some value. So you get a critical point. Uh, so here I should just say something as an exercise. You should be able to show um, what was the So that the beta JC equals half log Q by Q minus two. This uh, so if I repeat these calculations for arbitrary Q, I should get an answer like this. It immediately improves the Q revised answer which is one by Q, which meant that you had a transition even in one dimension. But here when I make Q equal to two, which is the 1D answer, I do not have a transition. The TC goes to zero. So uh, please uh, generalize this whole calculation to arbitrary Q, where you should get this answer. Okay, so uh, um, this raises one more question. So at, at a particular value of so is it clear now? So we have uh, for low temperature there are three fixed points and they correspond to R. Ah, we have to make sure that if I look at the magnetization it is non-zero at these fixed points. When x star, when y equal to one, m is zero. When y is not equal to one, we should just make sure that m is not zero. So let me just do that. Uh, Let me rewrite M in terms of the fix, uh, the ratios X. So what is my M? I now divide throughout by G plus, you know, G minus. So you get B to the power two beta G. Written correctly, I, I divided throughout by e to the minus beta j cube, uh, so that this term gives you e to the power two beta j x. This gives one. Minus, uh, this gives you x. Yeah, it's correct. So this is my expression for m in terms of the ratios x. So if I put x equal to one, yeah, these two terms will go to zero. So now we want to ask when x not equal to one, do they become zero or non-zero? Okay. Uh, but there is this nice recursion relation that is there. Where is that recursion? Of this kind. So if I take, so what do you know from there? It says x e to the power two beta j plus one. This is this particular expression that you derived to the fixed point condition. So if you divide throughout by x plus 
2 beta j whole cube, you get m is uh, x to the power 3 by 2 minus 1 And this you can check is uh, zero only when x equal to one. So the moment you have a non-zero fixed, non-trivial fixed point, the m is not one. And also you can check when x goes to one by x, m goes to minus m as it should, because you're changing, you're doing plus to minus. See, that also is easy. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, so the point is once you look at these ratios, every single quantity, even this, you can express in terms of X. The, all the bulk thermodynamic quantities are, are expressible only in terms of X. They no longer depend on the system size anymore. Yes. Ah, so that point I'll come to right now. The free energy, there is some, so let me, let, let, let me come to free energy right. Uh, okay. Uh, now there's a nice question that comes. So you had this multiple fixed points and you have to choose from one of them. So you ask, uh, Just like in the Curie-Weiss mean field theory, you had three fixed points, three solutions coming. What made you choose M not equal to zero? Why did M equal to zero is always a solution in the Curie-Weiss? Okay, so let us ask the question, selection criteria. So somebody, one says stability. Is that a good? Criteria? Uh, stability, I could also argue, no, anytime a non-trivial fixed point comes, non-trivial means x not equal to 1. Choose, uh, choose any non-trivial fixed point. But stability, these, these cannot be a good criteria. Stability has nothing to do with uh, no, this is some equation. The stability of the equation nothing to do with thermodynamics. Yeah, so one has to minimize some, uh, so one has to minimize, you have to, the free energy. So if you have multiple solution, you have to ask what's the free energy of each fixed point and take the minimum of those. And that gives you the right answer. So uh, here one has to check. So then now there are two questions. How to define a free energy for, the, for this uh, tree? Because again, you don't want the, uh, the surface contribution to have. So you want to have something called a bulk free energy. How do you define that? And secondly, one has to check that once you define a bulk free energy, uh, it is minimum for these fixed points as opposed to the x equal to one. So let me ask uh, how to define So one option uh, is that, like what Mustansi said, you put on a magnetic field H, this entire calculation goes through. That you have to check how to do with the magnetic field H. Then you get m as a function of h. Then you integrate with respect to h, you get the f. But there the problem is that you have to, you have to argue that when the fixed points exist, the m is given by that to get that. So I will give you some other scheme which seems to work uh, very well. It is uh, called, so this is a scheme to define bulk free energy. Once you are able to define a bulk free energy and you're able to do the fixed point, you can actually solve any model. Okay. So, uh, so 
to define that, so let me go back to my delete of my lattice. And I make a cut, I cut the tree like that, not at the first shell, this is my zeroth shell, this is my first shell, beyond the first shell I make cuts. So how many cuts do I have to make? I have to cut Q into Q minus 1. Cuts. So I, I generate Q into Q minus 1 subtrees. How many sides do I remove? I remove this side and then Q of the neighboring sides. One. Hmm? The, the first shell I'm defining as the sides connected to the central side. This is the central side. These are the first shell particles, or the sites, Q, Q of them. Oh, I'm, I, you're supposed to cut the, uh, the trees connected to the first shell side. Here, oh, I'm sorry. So it, is one, it is the one, uh, sorry, I, I, I cut. Have cut here. These I cut correctly, no? Yeah, this one. Okay, so I removed Q plus 1 sides, generated Q into Q minus 1 subtrees by making this cut. So now you, uh, you take out of these subtrees, you take Q, of Q minus 1 at a time. Then you add them so I should draw I drew a bit carelessly so I should Sorry, what are the questions? This is the central site. Then I drew three things in the first shell, Q of them. Then I make, then I cut beyond that. Yeah. So uh, connected to each one are Q minus one of them. So therefore I get Q into Q minus one subtrees. When I do that, these sides get removed. That's Q plus one sides get removed. Oh, no, no, now I'm going to say, so out of these subtrees, you take them, so I can take Q of them at a time, and then I add to each of them one single side, one more percentile side. I, I'll repeat the procedure. So I take now Q extra sides, no, not Q extra sides, for, for each, so out of this Q into Q minus one subtrees, I break them up into groups of Q. So Q, Q, Q. There are Q minus one of them. Q into Q minus one subtrees. I take Q of them and join them together by adding a new site. So join Q of them by adding new site. So this generates a new tree. Yeah. So, uh, so once I make these cuts, so in this case, for example, there are one, two, three, four, 
five, six uh, arb trees that are generated. Out of the six arb trees, I divide them into two groups, three and three. Okay, so I have this. Uh, and three more. Then I add two more sites here and I join them to form a new tree, two new trees. But with one generation less because we had removed, so as compared to my original lattice, these lattices have one generation less. Clear? Okay. So how many of them do I generate? I generate q minus one of them. So my part, so my partition function for this particular quantity is, so it's going to be called as z mu. Is z to the power q minus one, and called z one to the power q minus one. The original partition function z old. I'll call z naught. So this is my original partition function. I did some manipulation. I cut and remade them. And I get q minus 1 new lattices, each with the partition function z1, because it is not the, the number of shells is less. So I'll call it z1 to the power q minus 1. Okay. So now I can define free energies for one so f old is minus log z not f new is minus log z one to the power q minus one now how many in this construction how many sites have been removed I initially removed q, q plus 1 sites. To make this, I added q minus 1 sites more. So how many have been removed? This number of sites removed equals q plus 1 minus q minus 1, which is 2. So this partition function corresponds to, if it corresponds to n sites, this corresponds to n minus 2 sites. So if I take the difference between the two, delta f, which is z naught by z1 to the power q minus 1, it corresponds to the partition function to exactly two sides. So if I divide f is half log then this is my bulk partition function per site. What I've done is I've taken the central sites, made some changes there, removed two sites overall in the procedure, computed the change in free energy, and divided by two to get the partition function per free energy per site. Okay, this, this particular quantity, if you if you express in terms of the excess, the ratio, becomes a function only of x. So this is a function only of x, and that is and then, oh, and only on the fixed points, and no longer on the surface side. So this is a slightly ad hoc, it looks a bit ad hoc, but it works very well. If you, uh, uh, and it's probably, so it's sometimes called an ansatz for the free energy, but I think it works very well. Okay. Now if you, what one has to do, is to check that if you take that particular free energy and estimate it for uh, this fixed point, as compared to x equal to 1, is always lower. That is something one has to check. So uh, I have a lot of, I have some exercises. Uh, I made some questions for you people. Is there any question? Uh, did I go? Uh, so what is the procedure we did? We took the Cayley tree, wrote, defined partial partition functions, defined recursion relations for them, Look, look to the ratios, the ratios look to the fixed points of them. All thermodynamic quantities you can replace, express in terms of the fixed points, and that's a solution. So the, uh, 
Shall I go ahead? Yes. This one? Here? Ah, so in this example, I, I, when I cut here, I, I made six subtrees. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the six subtrees, I'm pairing them as three and three. Then you add a root site on extra site and connect them to that. Now it looks like the original bidder lattice, original, original Kali tree which you had. And I can make two of them. So, so let me call the partition function of this as Z1. I have two of them, Q minus one. So the total partition function is Z1 square of this combined system. And then I'm comparing with my or original partition function. And then you know uh, that is the factor of ah yeah 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 so um, so we have set uh, everywhere okay minus k t uh, here goes Okay, so all that remains to be done is to check that the free energy is lower for that. Okay, and uh, uh, so now let me do one calculation. I want to calculate the exponent beta, which Musan said I defined as. So half factor came because when I made these cuts, I removed Q plus one sides. In this case, four sides, one, two, three, four. And I added two sides here. In general, q minus two, q minus one. So the number of sides that are changed from when I did this procedure was two. Overall, two, and the change in free energy divided by two is my energy per site. That is the. Okay, actually, all the uh, remaining calculations, I think, I will leave as exercise. Uh, one was this one. Okay, so so take a coordination number Q, repeat the argument, and you should be able to get this for arbitrary Q. Then uh, two, so that uh, it's not temperature T minus so one you had an expression for uh, M. Uh, this expression. You have to just see if I make x 1 plus epsilon, not 1 plus epsilon, you have to make t equal to t plus epsilon, t minus. So if you, what you do is you do t equals tc minus epsilon. You ask how does x change? x would be 1 plus implies x is 1 plus delta. How is delta and epsilon related? Plug it back in here and you should be able to get beta. So that is this calculation. So show that this, that is beta equals R. Okay. Then, uh, again straightforward what one, uh, one has to do some calculations to become familiar. Uh, put on H not equal to zero. Repeat the recursion relations can find the fixed points and so on. And now show, show that delta equals D. So how was delta defined? It was defined, M goes as H is for one. So at T equal to TC, M should go as H is one by delta. You should be able to show exactly that delta equal to three. And the final thing, if you have the 
in a D is to find the determine scaling function. So in the previous lecture, you had learned that if I scale, so what had we learned? We had learned that if you plot m by t to the power beta, there's a universal scaling function. So can you determine that scaling function exactly? Because now everything is known. All the things are known. Free energy is known. The m as a function of h is known. Basically, whatever you want to compute is known exactly. So can you compute this? scaling function exactly. And finally, five. Uh, are you familiar with uh, POTS model? Okay, so let me define POTS model. POTS model is Hamiltonian is minus J summation Now the spin variables can take value one, two, three, four, up to any value. Let me take three state POTS model. We can take value one, two, three. Whenever two spins are aligned, your energy goes down. The delta function. Uh, you can try to ask, if you solve this uh, on the Bethe lattice, what, on the, what will happen? Now, unlike uh, uh, the icing model, you should be able to show. So this may, may require a bit of effort because it's but you should try, but let me tell what happens. If you try this, unlike the Bethe lattice, you will find that there are multiple stable fixed points, uh, including x equal to one, along with others. You have to apply the free energy condition correctly to get the right answer. So even for this particular problem, it was not important, this free energy, but as we look at more complicated examples, this calculation of free energy becomes important. Okay. Um, Okay, so I have 12 minutes in which I will br uh, just briefly discuss how uh, it is just not this tree, but you can make the lattice a bit more complicated and still solve. Yes. Oh no, so uh, if you take this particular expression and you work with, ah, that, so you have to, in fact that can be shown. So if you take this free energy but work with non-zero age, uh, which you can do, uh, then if you take del f by del h, you should get that m. So that's a nice exercise to do. <laughs> so please try, uh, that, that exercise also is, is much verified. You, know, you have made an ad hoc definition of free energy you should match with thermodynamics. So if you take this and differentiate, you should get that. Okay. Uh, the, uh, now, let me just briefly in five minutes tell you some other lattices where things are doable. So uh, these are called decorated Bethe lattices. Clearly, if I had nearest neighbor interaction, it was very easy to define in these models. But suppose I had some interaction which was based on a plucket. So for example, my Hamiltonian is, uh, my Hamiltonian is minus J SI FJ. But in addition, I have a four body interaction, which is J4 S1 S2. Let me, let me I'll just define this. On a, lat if, on a square lattice, if I take, this is S1, S2, S3, S4. Suppose I had some, so I just wrote down something. Suppose I had an interaction which depended on this placket. Now, uh, on a, on a, on a uh, Bethel lattice, it's not possible to define a placket, for example. Because now there are no loops coming in. But suppose you want to do models like this. It's still possible. The, you can define 
something called decorated methyl lattices in which you take uh, a usual methyl lattice. This uh, I have drawn with quotation number four. And what you do is to replace each of these sides by a wire. It need not be square and then it could be something else also, but an example would be square. So this goes to, so now it becomes it becomes a tree of squares. And you can define models on this and so on. For example, this is called a cosimate tree. The recursion relations become a bit more complicated, messy, but not so much messy, more, more messy. But if I had a tree like this, I can define a lattice like that, a Hamiltonian like that very easily. But I could have chosen any shape I wanted, not just a square. I could have even done with a triangle too. So it is possible to have not just beta lattices, but decorated beta lattice. All of them live in infinite dimension. They give you the mean field answer, but uh, uh, it is not. It, it just makes sure that some extra interactions can be taken care of easily. So I, I, I in this way I've defined. It is a yeah four vertex loop. So I can define S one, S two, S three, S four interaction there. Yeah. So for this I drew a square. In this, in this case I drew a square. But if I wanted a triangular lattice with body interaction, I could have drawn that too. It's just an example. So it, but it is possible to solve exactly the same way on lattices like this also. So decorated with the lattices are another way of solving. The, uh, so uh, I think that I'll stop now. Seven minutes left. If there's any uh, question. Yeah, so, uh, so let, let me call um, uh, this way of, um, so I mentioned there's something called a Bethe approximation, where one takes care of uh, nearest neighbor interaction as well. So this Bethe lattice is one way of implementing that. The other way of implementing that is to look at random lattices, where you have la lattices and you connect them randomly. And if you solve, the, solve on that, it will exactly the same answer. So there are two independent ways of doing it. But numerically, if one wants to mimic the beta lattice, is it not possible because the surface comes into play? You should, you should simulate on a random lattice. So a simulation of a random lattice will, will give you the answer you get in the beta lattice. It will have loops, but uh, what you have to show is that loops are not important. So you have to show the pro you have to co compute the probability of large loops uh, or small loops and show they're negligible. Ah, yes. So you uh, you can compute. Uh, just like, uh, uh, so one way to compute is to put the, uh, you can ask if I put my spin at the lat at the central side up, and I compute my spin at a different side. So for example, if I take a normalizing model in, in, in two dimension, and I, instead of looking at the spin-spin correlation, I put one spin up, constraint to be up, and ask what's the probability of spin up this is far away. So we can do a similar computation for this. Oh, this I, 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 defi I give an example. So if I want to uh, compute, uh, uh, you have to compute for all the spins on this side. If I look at the average spin, the central side, there are four of them. So you have to compute for that. It's just an example. But you can define, if you think for some time, you can define appropriate quantities for each one. Okay, so uh, next. No, no, better, better lattice is just a lattice. You can define any Hamiltonian on that. It only thing it does is it, the IC, so later on we'll try to solve the isomorphism in two-dimensional lattice. But the difficulty is that, you know, there are these loops that come. And it becomes very difficult to do. So in the better lattice, it's a contrived lattice. It's a contrived lattice, there are no loops. So the fact that you were able to write recursion relation which said, 
I only look at the subtree, the root side, was possible because that subtree is not interacting with the other subtree. Which is not the case on, on the regular lattice. So it is a contrived lattice, but a solution is possible and it, it obeys all thermodynamic properties correctly. Uh, very physical system. So Ising model is a physical system. We are solving it on this lattice. As I said, it, it mimics higher dimension. But uh, there are, you know, in these networks, in these uh, real networks, which mimic, which look like this. I have, I have presented, presented it like a, a calculational tool, which you are able to do a, a solution exactly. Now. Uh, Now you determine, no? Oh, how was it defined? Oh, so the, I, I'll define exactly the way Mustang's red defined, which was m by e to the power b theta. m is equal to b e to the power theta f of h by or w is what we call the scaling function, which is a universal function. So you get the universal mean field answer correct. So that is. And you can compare with the scaling function which Mustansi got from the land of free energy or the m square plus n to the power and check whether it's right or wrong. Which one is the right answer? Or, or you can even check whether it's universal or not. Okay. So 